Hello, good evening. Everybody understands me? Okay. Well, I'm uh, Mark, and I come from Bus Brussels. I work in two organizations. At, on the one hand, in an organization called FARO, the Flemish Interface for Culture and Heritage. We work for the world of museums, archives, and uh, people working on intangible heritage, financed by the Flemish government. And on the other hand, I work at the university where I teach three courses on uh, critical heritage studies, focusing in particular on uh, intangible culture heritage. <coughs> Just very briefly, what happened in the 21st century? The 21st century is the century of cultural heritage, and we see something special happening to that concept of heritage. In the 20th century, it was mainly referring to monuments and landscapes. The World Heritage Convention of 1972 was very famous, so immovable heritage. The last uh, 20 years, it, the semantic field of heritage expanded. And it was also used in a lot of countries all over the world for movable heritage. Uh, for instance, objects you find in museums, in archives, in libraries, digital heritage, and also intangible heritage. So that concept has uh, taken a much broader uh, meaning. This uh, expansion was translated into, uh, in powerful texts like laws, conventions, conventions of UNESCO, conventions of the Council of Europe. A whole network of institutions has emerged all over the world using that word cultural heritage. And the word was also appropriated by groups of communities, volunteers, and so on. Very important, and I will come back to that, is the notion of culture brokerage, mediation, to work with cultural heritage. And heritage is definitely on policy agendas uh, in many countries all over the world. How is the academic world dealing with this? I'm not sure how it is here in Germany. At least in Belgium, uh, the academic world is adapting very slowly. So I, I work, for instance, in history and art history departments. 20 years ago, most of my colleagues did not want to hear the word heritage. And today, slowly, they are changing their opinion. So it is difficult to put this on the academic agenda, and that's what I try to do. What you see in society, cultural heritage has uh, obtained a lot of value. And uh, this is happening all over the world and even on a European level, where this paradigm shift is embraced. And you can here see a definition of cultural heritage uh, proposed by the uh, Council of Europe, where they say cultural heritage consists of the resources inherited from the past in all forms and aspects. So tangible, intangible, digital uh, forms like monument sites and landscapes, skills, practices, knowledge and expressions of human creativity, intangible heritage, as well as collections, elements you find in museums, libraries and archives. It originates from the interaction between people and places through time and is constantly evolving. These resources are of great value to society from a cultural, environmental, social and economic point of view. Here you hear the four concepts uh, of sustainable development and their sustainable management con constitutes a strategic choice for the 21st century. So today one can see, as you probably know, 2018 is the European Year for Cultural Heritage and finally see Europe also embracing uh, this broad uh, concept. In the literature, uh, one of the most famous uh, names is Laurie Jane Smith, uh, uh, connected to Australian National University in Canberra. She's like the godmother of uh, cultural heritage studies. She coined the concept of authorized heritage discourse to uh, basically refer to these kind of buildings. Think about elites, big churches, big castles, uh, managed by professionals like art historians. Uh, people can, uh, are allowed to enter, to admire, don't touch anything, and uh, admire the, this glory of the past. 
we are moving in the 21st century to something we could call a participatory heritage discourse or a popular heritage discourse where a lot of other actors are uh, being involved. And here you see uh, an element on the representative list of intangible culture heritage of humanity. It refers uh, to a ritual in, in uh, Peru where they build the bridge between two rocks. Uh, every year they re uh, make the bridge, uh, tying the knots. And it's a, a very beautiful example of every year continuing this tradition, restarting again. So this is a good symbol of what uh, the popular or participatory heritage discourse uh, is all about. Okay. So heritage, it has expanded, and uh, heritage policy is also uh, changing. And I would like to use uh, a Nobel Prize winner to uh, make that point, and now s try to see if this works. And I invite you to listen. This is Bob Dylan, as you all of guests. And Come it. gather round people wherever you roam And admit that the waters around you have grown And accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone If your time to you is worth saving Then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone For the times they are changing Prophesize with your pen And keep your eyes wide The chance won't come again And don't speak too soon For the wheel's still in spin And there's no telling who That it's naming For the loser and I'll be laid out a win For the times they are changing I'm senators, congressmen Please heed the call Don't stand in the door don't block up the hall For he that gets hurt Will be he who has stalled For the battle outside region We'll see you shake your windows And rattle your walls For the times they are changing Our mothers and fathers Throughout the land And don't criticize What you can't understand Your sons and your daughters I'm beyond your command Your old road is rapidly aging Please get out of the new one If you can't lend your hand For the times they are changing We're almost there <laughs> The line it is drawn And the curse it is cast The slowest one now Will later be fast As the present now Will later be past The order Okay, so this is a nice song from 1963, and you can, if you listen to it today, you can, and you think about global warming and Wi-Fi, you see this publicity for Hi-Fi, and wi Wi-Fi wasn't there in 1963, so come gather around people wherever you roam, that's not the roaming of uh, internet, but uh, it's walking around. Admit that the waters around you have grown and accept that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If you think about global warming, and especially if you li live like I do, close to the North Sea, then you can imagine uh, a special story around this. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. But perhaps we can still... Uh, do something about the uh, warming up of the climate, uh, but then actions have to be taken. And you see there the sustainable uh, development goals of the United Nations. I will come back to them later. Some writers and critics who prophesize with, with their pen, that's basically what the Brundtland Commission did when coining that notion of sustainable development. 
1987. So they uh, defined the number of needs, a number of needs of, the po of poor people in the world, but also limitations uh, from technology and social organization on the environment's ability to meet present and future needs. So, uh, and in order to do this, and I really like the comparison of the Sustainable Development Goals, one of the official uh, ways of representing these goals, and the Wheel of Fortune, the game in the United States. For the wheel still in spin, and there's no telling who that is naming, for the loser now will be later to win, for the times they are changing. And, of course, politicians have uh, a huge responsibility. This is, for instance, the meeting in 2017 of the G20 here in Germany. And uh, they are giving a wake-up call. What action should be taken uh, to uh, prevent further disasters. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land, don't criticize what you can't understand. I use here both Frankenstein and the ethics and the intangible culture heritage uh, uh, paradigm. I will come back to that later because people are experimenting with uh, heritage, trying to do uh, something with it. The line it is drawn, the curse is cast. Uh, here you see the genius, uh, and you can make a wish what he can do. But I also like this image because for me it represents what the whole movement of uh, safeguarding intangible culture heritage is all about. It's a new way of looking at heritage. And uh, I feel that a lot of colleagues are trying to get or uh, trying to push this back into the bottle because they don't like all uh, the elements that come uh, along with it. But the spirit is out of the bottle and uh, so things will be changing. Okay. What did I want to say? with the previous thing. So the notion of heritage has expanded. And uh, today for society or for the planet Earth, it is a resource uh, to, be, uh, to work with. OK, for the next part, I will give a number of examples of items that were in the news in Flanders, where I live. And I will use uh, four examples to make a number of points. As you might have known, last Sunday, we had an election in Belgium. Uh, for the municipal councils, so the local villages and the cities elected their new uh, mayor and alderman. And in the city of Mechelen, uh, there, uh, this man, Bart Somers, he uh, won with a landslide. He got 47.91% uh, of the votes, which is an absolute majority. He was plus 15%. And uh, his party was a combination between the Liberal Party and the Green Party. And as in most uh, cities in Belgium, the politics were mainly about polarization, trying to uh, make real distinctions between groups of people, emphasizing uh, the difference between migrants and people uh, who have lived for a long time in those cities, and really uh, hammering on those elements. In Mechelen, they did a totally different uh, approach. And since a few years, they are embracing diversity and really investing in this kind of living together uh, policy in involving a lot of people. And uh, that's apparently, uh, this is also a way to win elections. This man, Bart Somers, he, in 2016, he got a two-yearly award for uh, best mayor of the world. And he, uh, so you, here you see the runners up on number 10. It was Henriette Rieker from Cologne. But number one was this man from Mechelen. And in his speech on the website of the best mayors of the world, uh, he explains what he has done. He emphasizes connecting integration, and uh, trying to work and embrace diversity. So that's the first element I, I would like to emphasize. Another uh, newspaper clipping, so this is in Dutch, perhaps you can read. It was also last week. In Belgium, we have four, minister, uh, resp four ministers responsible for the climate, one of the French-speaking part, one for Brussels, one for Flanders, one for Belgium. 
there was a meeting in Luxembourg uh, about uh, 10 days ago where they were discussing uh, measures uh, for, uh, against climate change or managing climate change, and none of the ministers showed up. And this was used in the press. Well, there, they, there are ministers, we have four ministers, and they're not even interested. So this was used as an element to uh, emphasize this. On the other hand, Belgium has also, rep, uh, has also uh, been working with the Agenda 2030. This was, for instance, uh, the report they presented last year where they claim we, that in Belgium we are doing a really good job and trying to uh, obtain these sustainable development goals. And in fact, I must say this Agenda 2030 with the sustainable development goals, it is embraced in civil society and a lot of uh, local communities and also cities are putting this in their, on their agenda. And the next few weeks when the new uh, local uh, municipalities uh, will start again with the new policy plan, this will be very high on the, on the agenda. So it's a mixed image you see here. The whole movement for the Sustainable Development Goals, it was uh, launched in the family of the United Sna Nations and Ban Ki-moon, the former Secretary General, he phrased it very eloquently, we don't have a plan B because there is no planet B. And if you look at the resolution 71.1, uh, Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, it's an interesting document to read. We prob you probably, I hope, know the 17 development goals and the 169 targets that are now being used uh, all over the world, I hope also in your city and your country, uh, to develop policy. But out of the uh, 91 paragraphs in that document, only paragraph 59 is about those goals. And if we uh, look for the cities and urban life, we find a number of articles. And for instance, Article 34, uh, it refers to cities and urban activities. And if we read it, we recognize that sustainable urban development and management are crucial to the quality of life of our people. We will work with, we, and that is the countries, we will work with local authorities and communities to renew and plan our cities and human settlements so as to foster community cohesion and personal security and to stimulate innovation and employment. And then we will reduce the negative impacts of urban activities, hazardous for human health and environment. We will also work to minimize, I'm reading the red phrases, we will also work to minimize the impact of cities on the global climate system. We will talk about this later in the Habitat 3 conference in Quito. So if you look at uh, how cities and urban life are, are approached here, it's more like a danger for, uh, for uh, the climate and for the evolution of the planet. And this is in sharp contrast with what you actually see in the Agenda uh, 2030 and in the Sustainable Development Goals, where cities are seen as a key to actually do something about that. And this mixed image of uh, urban life as a positive and a negative factor, you find it in, an, in a, a lot of documents. In these documents, for instance, in uh, Article 36, the intercultural understanding, tolerance, and mutual respect, and an ethic of global citizenship and shared responsibility is put forward. So here again, remember what this program of Bart Somers, the best mayor of the world, was all about. He connects all these items and these uh, ideas. And uh, today there's this global call to change and to save our world. 70 years ago to, uh, when the United Nations, but also UNESCO, uh, were founded. Uh, this was mainly about uh, establishing connections through education, through understanding, to avoid war. Today we have uh, other challenges. We can be the first generation to succeed in ending poverty, one of the challenges of the Agenda 2030, just as we may be, just as we may be the last generation to have a chance of saving the planet. The world will be a better place in 2030 if we succeed in our objectives. 
So it's a very activist uh, proposal that is being embraced by a lot of actors in the world. And if you compare it to the Millennium Goals that were uh, uh, pursued between 2000 and 2015, you do feel a difference in uh, the scale of how it is embraced. Among the Sustainable Development Goals, there's Goal 11, make cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. So uh, urban life and working with cities is really part of one of the 17 goals. And uh, among these, uh, under these goals, you find a number of targets, and I will refer to a few of them. 11.3, by 2030, uh, countries can enhance inclusive and sustainable urbanization and capacity for participatory, integrated, and sustainable human uh, settlement planning and management in all countries. This inclusive and participatory, they are key words, because they're also the key words in present day heritage studies, heritage policy, and uh, in city management. There's one uh, target mentioning uh, uh, heritage, 11.4, that we can strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. That's one of the few instances, instances where culture is actually mentioned in these uh, development goals. And if you read these words, cultural and natural heritage of the world, you can think about the World Heritage uh, Convention. And there were a number of other targets uh, that we can support positive economic, social, and environmental links between urban, peri-urban, and rural areas by strengthening national and regional development planning. Okay. A third element in the news recently was a big project where cities were involved, and in Dutch it's called Curieuse Neusen. You could uh, translate it as Curious Noses, and it refers to a lot of citizens that were willing to participate in a, in a large-scale investigation. About 20,000 citizens in cities all over uh, Flanders participated. And what did they do? They, uh, during a few weeks, they, in their streets, they measured uh, the quality of the air. And uh, it, this was supported by a number of university, universities where this air quality map was uh, developed. And uh, this is a nice example of citizen science where uh, by putting this kind of device that on, on, the, on the front of their house, these this images you often see when houses are sold, and inside this objective here, the curious noses measured the, the quality of the air. These kind of devices were placed there to measure uh, the, the pollution in the air. This, this generated this kind of maps. And these maps were published about, uh, I think, 14 days ago in the national press for every city, a very detailed map of the air quality street per street. And this caused, uh, from one day to another, the, no, the importance of air quality in cities was on the political agenda. As you remember, we had elections last Sunday, and uh, thanks to these citizen projects, the, a lot of people in society were sensitized about the quality uh, of, of air, about the importance of policy. For instance, in the city of Ghent, they... Uh, developed uh, a complex plan to uh, uh, improve the air quality. This actually worked, and this got a lot of uh, good press uh, among the population. Okay. So you can measure these elements and these participatory ways of, of doing citizen science. It's one way, but, but you can also uh, try to take action. And... Uh, all these huge problems of climate change, uh, it's very difficult to find a solution. And uh, one of the ways these problems are called are wicked problems. This is a policy term uh, that has been developed, among others, in Australia. 
and it basically says these kind of problems, they cannot be easily solved. They don't have a stopping rule where you can see the problem, develop a method, and then you find a solution. Actually, these problems can never be solved because they evolve uh, constantly. And the only way to tackle these very difficult, wicked problems is through by working together. There are a number of measures to deal with wicked problems. You can do it in an authoritative way to, by appointing a number of experts and letting them devise plans in a competitive uh, way where, where you can uh, oppose different strategies together or a collaborative way. And uh, it, to engage all kinds of stakeholders to discuss together and to make a general policy plan. This participatory uh, approach is probably the best, best way uh, to go. And this is also something uh, you find in a lot of uh, other countries. Okay. I will once again refer to this uh, problem of floods. If you take a look at this map, these are uh, populations in cities that are exposed to uh, major flooding in 2050. This is a very alarming uh, map uh, that should uh, mobilize a lot of people. If you look at mega cities, you see that as more and more people are going to live in these very huge cities close to the seaside or close to water, this is a major problem uh, by 2050. So uh, it is high time to think on how to, to deal with this. In a lot of uh, policy work, people are trying to think how can we uh, try to avoid this, uh, uh, this evolution. And uh, one of the solutions that often is proposed is actually to concentrate more and more people in cities and to develop new ways of uh, dealing with this. And one of the exciting new development is what is called vertical gardening, where a lot of skyscrapers can be built and be transformed into these kind of urban gardens. You find projects like this all over the world, uh, in the Netherlands, but also in the United States, where people are thinking, uh, can we uh, involve this kind of mega agriculture in cities could that be a solution? Okay. So a number of problems, a number of issues, a number of possible solutions. Okay. The last part in, in the news, that, uh, something that is in the news in Flanders, is the fact that a new exhibition has opened in Vienna on 2 October 2018. It's about Bruegel, one of our favorite painters in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Wien. And it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to peer over the master's shoulder. And I will let, let the director, if it works, explain. Mit der Sonderausstellung Bruegel vollendet sich für das Kunsthistorische Museum ein Projekt der Superlative. Anlässlich des 450. Todestags dieses wohl größten niederländischen Meisters des 16. Jahrhunderts zeigen wir it. erstmals eine große monografische Schau, die ausschließlich von Peter Breugel Okay. Okay. Then, then I will uh, stop this video. What she is basically inviting us to do is to come to Vienna to see this once-in-a-lifetime exhibition where uh, a lot of the paintings of the 16th century Bruegel are uh, assembled and being compared. So for the first time, for instance, we got these two images of the Tower of Babel together. The one is kept in Vienna uh, in, in the Kunsthistorisches Museum, the other one in Rotterdam, the, tor, the Tower of Babel, uh, both painted in the same year. And the, the story of the, in the Bible of the, of the Tower of Babel, if you read it today with uh, connecting uh, climate change, uh, city life, and so on, it, it makes a confusing impression. So let's, let's look at this uh, idea. What happened? Uh, just before the Tower of Babel uh, was built. We had the big flood. Noah saved a number of animals and he saved basically his, his own family. His own family uh, started uh, reproducing uh, children and the population grew. 
Thanks to the fact that they all came from the Ark, the whole world had one language and a common speech. And if we read the, the, this part of Genesis, uh, as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, Babylon, and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord, so God said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. Then the Lord scattered them all over the earth. If you, now today, we are trying to embrace diversity, to try to live together in cities, to actually prevent the flood uh, coming back. It's the total reverse, and, and it makes us think about how to deal with diversity and how to deal with uh, these issues, and about city life. Bruegel, in his painting of the Tower of uh, Babel, uh, he also reflect this, reflected on uh, this condition of humanity, and in this painting, a lot of uh, images of the city. You can see uh, the Colosseum here, uh, connected with a lot of cit city parts. In the background, the image is not very clear. You can see the city of Antwerp, uh, where Bruegel lived. And uh, in the catalog of the, of the exhibition in, in Vienna, they characterize what we see here in, in a very nice way. The subject of the Tower of Babel is a verit veritable melting pot of historical fact, Old Testament tradition and myth, making it into a particularly complex motif and one endowed with timeless metaphorical potential. Unity and division, thirst for power, construction and destruction, linguistic unity and the confusion of tongues. And uh, it is on the one hand seen as a motif of hubris, of uh, having too much... Uh, ideas and, and going for them. If you look at how Bruegel uh, paints the details, he has a very uh, basic understanding of what human beings try to do. And one of the things, if you go to Vienna, one of the very nice things they do in the museum, they have uh, very detailed photographs of all kinds of scenes on that painting. So if you please go there. Uh, and here you see, it's, it's a very tiny part of, of, the, of the picture. And here you see daily life going on in, on the tower. You see there the vertical gardening uh, on the tower, in, in the Tower of Babel, where people try to live together. And one particularly striking image is in the door there, where you see a couple holding hands going into the tower together. And this, I, this idea of working together uh, on this tower and trying to uh, unite is present all over uh, the building. In the time of Bruegel, one of the best friends of Bruegel was Abraham Ortelius, the Antwerp cartographer who uh, made the Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, the first modern ad atlas. And an annex of this uh, work was the Civitatis Orbem Terrarum, the Atlas of Cities published in 1572 here in Cologne, uh, and it, the six volumes were added between 1572 and 1618. And uh, this was painted by a number of friends. Uh, uh, this was made and uh, constructed by a number of friends of Ortelius and also people who knew uh, Bruegel, like for instance, uh, uh, Joris Hufnagel, who actually took a number of, of the drawings of Bruegel and included them in the atlas. Recently, two years ago, two books uh, appeared, on the one hand by Stephanie Porras, Peter Bruegel's Historical Imagination, and on the other hand, Tina Luc Megang's Erudite Eyes, Friendship, Art and Erudition in the Networks of Abraham Ortelius. And what one of the things they did is to look at these maps of cities and try to decode the culture program uh, behind it. This is, for instance, the map of uh, this city, Cologne, 
And do notice also the uh, figures dressed in uh, supposedly typical clothes uh, from the region. And what they discovered uh, on the one hand is that these costume figures, you see them all over the atlas, and there are several ways of explaining it. In the work itself, you find this uh, rather remarkable explanation by Heer Brown, here from Cologne, uh, because they saw it as a way to prevent uh, it being copied and used uh, by the Ottoman Empire. Nobody has to be afraid that our work may harm the Christians in any way, because with its help, their major cities could be conquered by the enemy. That danger, which is rather real, is avoided in this way. We asked the different kinds of clothing of all nations and several people to be drawn at each city, both the high and low classes. The reason is because the bloodthirsty Turks, who are not allowed to look upon representation of the human form, will never allow this book, however great their use for it may be. That's what is published as the explanation. In recent work, and that's what both uh, Stephanie Porras and Tine Megang explained, if you see in this period a lot of costume books, uh, how people were dressed, were published. And there was a whole program there about diversity. It was a way to show uh, diversity among people and that people in this atlas could actually uh, live uh, side by side and uh, show the power of diversity. This was the program of Bruegel and his network and how they uh, proceed. Okay. Another work by Bruegel is this, the carnival, uh, the battle between uh, carnival and Lent. On the one hand, you see these carnival figures. On this side, you see the people fasting and uh, it's a complex image, and this image has been used to, uh, it's, you can tell a lot of stories about that, but this story has been used to, by, among others, Peter Burke, to explain what happened between the 16th and the 18th cent century, where there was a growing uh, division between elite culture, or sacred uh, culture, and popular culture. And these two worlds drifted apart. In the 16th century, if you were a nobleman, you could easily participate in the carnival. In the 18th century, this was uh, something for another class, and as a, you uh, try to cultivate your own elite work. Of course, this dichotomy is not so strict, but in any case, that's what happened. And you see this couple in the middle, I hope, the two persons uh, walking there, there's a fool uh, showing them the light. That's basically what happened between the 16th and the 19th century. That these middle class persons also tried to walk away from uh, this popular culture. And uh, it was then rediscovered later in, in, for instance, folklore studies. But the main tendency for uh, authorities was to try to educate, to civilize this uh, popular culture in cities and to transform it into uh, something that was religiously, from a religious point of view, more acceptable. This idea of separation and distinction between elite and popular culture was something that uh, went on until the, uh, at the end of the 20th century, where gradually people uh, started to appreciate this popular culture more. And one of the major game changers uh, is what happened in 2003, when UNESCO actually made a convention on safeguarding popular culture, or folklore if, if you want, but one of the things they did was to change the name into intangible culture heritage. And the fact that this word was used, it convinced a lot of policymakers to take uh, these forms of culture uh, ser more seriously. Okay. Bruegel, in, the, an, in a number of his works, he published, for instance, this uh, very nice image of uh, the celebration of the an annual anniversary of the church. You see a lot of activities uh, going on, and uh, it's very difficult to read, but on the big sign of St. George, you, s you see the slogan, let the peasants keep their uh, kermis, their, their, their feast. It was actually a kind of a protest 
to, uh, to local officials that tried to prohibit these kind of festivities. So also in Bruegel's time you find these uh, elements. What I like a lot about Bruegel, this is for instance this painting about the proverbs. One of the things today we are looking for is to find ways to safeguard or to protect these uh, forms of uh, intangible culture heritage, uh, customs, proverbs, uh, and so on. Probably the most uh, influential and the most successful form of uh, developing an inventory of proverbs is this painting. This painting was painted in the 16th century and today people who speak Dutch recognize and still uh, are able to explain most of these proverbs. And this is partly due to, to the fact that this image was reproduced over and over again and that it uh, functioned on its own. The same could be said about this painting, about the children's games of Bruegel. Today also a lot of these games are uh, known and uh, also uh, cultivated today. And you can see this, for instance, in the activities uh, of a number of organizations that try to learn young children how to play these games. And here you find, for instance, the painting by uh, Bruegel of the children's games and an invitation to uh, come learn these games. One of the items that is on the good practices list of UNESCO is a program called Ludo Diversity uh, from uh, a museum in Mechelen where they actually tried to develop a whole program to safeguard uh, these games. Okay. These paintings of Bruegel, they had an influence on popular, and still have an influence on popular culture in uh, Flanders today. And, but you also see this evolving. And I give you this example of the city of Wingene, where they actually dress up as uh, characters from Bruegel, but they try to adapt their feast. And what you see here is the annual ritual of cell phone throwing. What they do is to co collect old cell phones and then the competition is to throw that cell phone as far as you can and then uh, people can win this game. So you see this tradition, uh, how it evolves and, and adapts to present day work. Okay. Before going on to UNESCO, I, I just want to show that uh, a number of things happened the last 20 years. And the best way to explain it, and probably the, one of the things you will remember of my lecture today, is uh, how people, deaf people can express in sign language what is happening with heritage today. And about, and I will stand like this, about the usual form to express heritage is like this in sign language. It's something you, you take, which is in your stomach, and this is heritage. This is how you express her if you're a deaf person in, in Belgium or in Flanders. But there has been a whole discussion uh, going on when people try to follow what was happening uh, with this UNESCO Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Culture Heritage. And today they propose to change this sign into this. So what you take, you take the heritage like this and in sign language, this is the past, this is the present, this is the future, and what you actually do with culture heritage is to take it from the present and transmit it to the future. So, and so if you remember something of my lecture, this is what happened in the 21st century. We go from this identity, something fixed, strong, in the stomach, to more flexible transmission towards the future. Okay. So... UNESCO, the successive frames and interlocking frames. You remember my, uh, this image? A lot of things have changed in how the concept of uh, heritage has uh, evolved. And UNESCO is a major player in this evolution. UNESCO, as you probably know, it's the Organization for Culture, Education, Science of the United Nations. How does UNESCO function? Uh, there's a general conference where every country in the world is a member. Every country has one vote. There's a kind of board of directors, the executive board that, that uh, meets every year, and a secretariat, the administration with the secretary general. 
What can UNESCO do? They can uh, launch several texts. They can either launch a program, which is uh, something that people uh, try to follow. It, is a, it has a very soft uh, character. A stronger text is a recommendation it's that people, uh, countries from all the world, they, they launch a text to, with a number of good ideas, but without legal consequences. And then you also have a convention which is uh, part of international law, and uh, that is the most powerful text. How does UNESCO make these kind of texts? And uh, it's by building consensus. And suppose that we, all together, we, and this could be a representative UNESCO meeting, everyone is from one country, and we have to agree on something. For instance, on a convention on uh, heritage or on... Uh, uh, urbanization, and we want to make an agreement on how we can make these texts. A very easy way would be to propose something and uh, then hold a vote. And then you each raise your hand if you're pro, we count them, and if you're against, I also count them, and the majority wins. Well, this is uh, not how UNESCO functions, because they think that's a much too aggressive way of reaching decisions. The idea is that consensus has to be built and reached. And this is how consensus is reached. We have a discussion, somebody uh, makes a proposal, and then we test for consensus. If I propose something, for instance, let's declare this as a piece of world heritage, and nobody, I say, we'll do this, nobody objects, then it's a yes, consensus achieved, and we will do some action. If I test for consent, is this world heritage? And somebody would say, uh, no, I don't agree. Then uh, we can ask, what are your concerns? And then uh, we have a discussion with, with uh, all of us. And then we can uh, do a number of things. Either we can modify the proposal. Well, let's call it not heritage, but an interesting microphone that could be used uh, in UNESCO meetings. Uh, do we agree? Yes, consensus. No, then again, concerns raised. And then the, the game starts over and over again. What can we do and concerns are raised? We can modify the proposal, test for consensus. We can say, well, I don't really care about uh, this and I can live with it. If you think it's an important object for UNESCO, I, I stand aside and let it pass. Then we also achieve consensus. Or somebody can say, I really do not agree. And if you uh, say, well, we can continue this discussion over my dead body that uh, this will pass, then the decision will block. And, this, uh, and at that point, either we go away and say we can't reach consensus, or we can go to this very aggressive move of calling a vote. And then we can call the, the majority. This is how decisions are made between the 193 countries in UNESCO for almost everything. This is the game that is played. So the phrase you hear uh, a lot, can you all live with this proposal? And if we, that's the whole game that UNESCO plays over and over again. But that's also the way that in a lot of heritage work today, decisions are made. Trying to build on consensus and to focus uh, on consensus. How do the, does this work? Suppose we are making a text on heritage policy, and we say, well, let's uh, make a text where the word participatory is crucial. And we all agree, of course, where inclusive is important. We also agree where egalitarian, everybody is equal. Okay, no objections. Where we cooperate, cooperative, we also agree. And then we have a little space left for two pieces, and there's the proposal, let's make an elegant text, and somebody else says, Let's make an ethical text. And discussions start, we can't agree. Uh, the discussion, discussion continues and somebody says, we have to go for something solution-oriented. No, sustainable is the key word. And somebody else says, it's strategic. So we have this whole discussion and we can't reach consensus. How does UNESCO solve this problem? It's by doing this. You have the P, participatory, E for inclusive, egalitarian, and so on. So we have these pieces. 
Do we have consensus? Yes, we have consensus and we make this text. What has been done, everybody can go home and explain, well, this S stands for solution-oriented or it's strategic. And that's basically how UNESCO tries to do its consensus. This is why UNESCO conventions and texts are relatively vague, that nothing is defined, and that a lot of words uh, can continue. So uh, UNESCO is best known for the World Heritage Convention, but there's a runner-up since 2003, the uh, Intangible Culture Heritage Convention. There are a number of heritage conventions uh, in UNESCO. The most famous are the 1954 Convention on the Protection of Culture Property property in the event of armed conflict. We have a convention of 1970 about trafficking of culture property. The most famous, the 1972 convention on world heritage, the 2001 convention on underwater culture heritage, 2003 safeguarding, 2005 the protection of the diversity of culture expressions. The World Heritage Convention you probably all know, it's the most famous convention of UNESCO. And it has these strange notions that there could be something of outstanding universal value, that it can be put on a list and protected as such by uh, humanity. This is a very popular convention, uh, this convention of 1972. A lot of proposals have been uh, put forward. But in 2004, uh, an analysis was made about what is overrepresented, what is underrepresented. Overrepresented is Europe historic towns, uh, items related to Christianity, historical art, uh, art historical periods, architectural heritage. What is underrepresented, 20th century, places strongly associate, associated with living cultures and items from the Arab state, Africa and Pacific. Since 2004, UNESCO tries to deal with this. This is the World Heritage Map of items put on the World Heritage List. And uh, this angry makes a lot of people in the world rather angry. Because, and it's, it's literally so, so people get really annoyed when they see this continent. There's one continent that needs a special map because about half of the items on the World Heritage List is there. You see Europe over there. And one of the reasons why in 2003 the Convention on Safeguarding of Intangible Culture Heritage was made was to propose a kind of counter-narrative to find uh, solutions where uh, culture from other parts of the world uh, could also be dealt with. And if you're talking about safeguarding intangible culture heritage, if you remember the sign of how deaf people talk about heritage, this is the second point you should remember. And if there's a pop quiz at the end of the element and somebody says, is it possible to talk about intangible world heritage? then you should say no. Because the word safeguarding intangible culture heritage can never be called world heritage. In almost every newspaper report you will read about intangible heritage, the journalist will use the word world heritage. But it's wrong because it's a kind of counter program. So uh, one of the first ways of dealing with this was this map, uh, a program called Masterpieces of Oral and Intangible Heritage of Humanity. 90 items were proclaimed, and you see this kind of alternative map that was produced as a uh, counteraction for world heritage. Okay, I see the time is running fast. I will skip a number of elements. In 1989, there was a so-called recommendation on the safeguarding of popular culture and folklore. And this recommendation of UNESCO, uh, it was followed by... Uh, very few countries. Most of the countries tried to ignore it. And in uh, 10 years later, in 1999, there was a big conference in Washington trying to understand why. And one of the reasons uh, was that uh, this convention was too limited. There were not, of, not, not enough stakeholders involved. And the main groups that were uh, mentioned as actors were researchers and government cultural workers. And the idea that was proposed by the uh, people doing the evaluation is that this should be expanded to producers, non-governmental organizations, private sector institutions, and so on. So what was wrong with that 
original UNESCO uh, recommendation. You see here the two ducks looking this way, the research scholars and the governmental culture workers. What should be the, that's the recommendation of uh, 1999. What should be the convention of 2003? You see all these rabbits uh, walking this way with a lot of actors together to uh, try to be involved in this new way of participatory uh, approach of dealing with these actors. Okay. In 2003, after some debates, this convention on safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage was uh, accepted by UNESCO, and it has a number of purposes. To safeguard traditions and customs, to ensure respect of communities, groups, and individuals concerned, to raise awareness uh, for this kind of heritage and to ensure mutual appreciation, and also to provide international cooperation and assistance. And one of the elements in that convention is the so-called Article 16, the representative list of the intangible culture heritage of humanity. Most of the people talking about the convention refer to this uh, list. There are 37 other articles that are much more interesting than this list that is kind of a counter program to the World Heritage List. And if you ask me, I was one of the drafters of that convention. I represented Belgium as uh, in the, 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 I was in the Belgian delegation making that convention. And if you ask me, what does this mean, representative list? I don't know. And that's precisely the idea. Some will explain it, this is kind of world heritage. And others will say, well, these are just examples. Others will say it's statistical, uh, uh, it's statistics, uh, so it's this kind of representative. Actually, we don't know. So remember the pieces puzzle, uh, and this is uh, the case for most of these words in this uh, 2003 and other UNESCO conventions. And I really like that, because if the definitions would be very strict and very clear, it would not work. This way, it opens a frame that uh, allows for uh, complexity. Okay. I briefly mentioned the masterpieces list. This was a program of UNESCO between 2001 and 2005 to raise awareness. And the notion of masterpieces, uh, that's this notion of unique and special value. This was not accepted by a lot of countries. So uh, this was the reason why elements of the masterpieces was transformed to the representative list. One of the examples is the Carnaval in, in the city of Banche, which was on the masterpieces list since uh, 2003. In 2008, when the convention got operational, there were all these items were transformed to the representative list. And uh, the city council of Banche did not like this, so you probably have seen the I, I hope you have seen the, lo let me see if I find the logo of the Intangible Culture Heritage Convention. It's this kind of at sign. Uh, what you can never do is to put the World Heritage sign on uh, an item, and this is the official publicity by the city of Banj, breaking all the rules and saying, well, we actually want our, our carnival not to be on that representative list, but we want to be called World Heritage. This is how uh, it has been used. Okay. So if you would work with that convention, remember that there are a number of taboo words that one cannot use. And you could think about a kind of a control alt delete movement where if you submit a file to UNESCO, never mention folklore, folk, folk life, folk tradition, volkskunde, folk, popular culture, culture community, ethnic, essentialism, or words like world heritage, authenticity, unique, universal value, outstanding value. So that's all these words in the second column that are characteristic for world heritage. These are taboo words in the 2003 UNESCO Convention. So, and this is one of the reasons why uh, people are using this convention, but also struggling with it. The most important article in that convention is Article 15, participation of communities, groups, and individuals. Nobody knows what a community or a group is. That's the general idea. But here, for the first time in, in a UNESCO convention, this participatory approach is being emphasized and put uh, 
forward in a central way. Okay, I will. One of the interesting combinations, the fact that community, and people often think about local community, is not defined, is that you can combine it with other texts. Like, for instance, the Council of Europe's Framework Convention on the Value of Cultural Heritage for Society, the FARO Convention. As you remember, I work in an organization called FARO. This is my favorite convention. And we have this definition, heritage community, consisting of people who value specific aspects of cultural heritage, which they wish within the framework of public action to sustain and transmit to future generations. The advantage of the 2003 convention is that you can actually combine this uh, with this element. And in Flanders, we adopted this FAR convention by adding not only people, but also organizations like museums and archives as part of that community. And this opens up a lot of possibilities. A lot of countries and today, 173 countries have ratified uh, the convention. So that's almost every country in the world. There are a number of exceptions, like the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, United States who are out of UNESCO at the moment. They haven't ratified the convention, but most of the other countries, also Germany, has. One of the... Uh, okay. One of the lessons I've learned is that if you look at the safeguarding program of intangible cultural heritage that works, it never comes spontaneously. A community or group very seldom can uh, do this on their own. Often you need the presence of mediators, so-called brokers, uh, facilitators, mediators, to uh, bridge different... Uh, parts of society, in the community, and to translate this idea of uh, uh, intangible heritage to uh, groups and communities in, inside. Okay, I will. One of the challenges today is uh, so-called ethical challenges. What is the right thing to do to involve individuals, communities, groups, and organizations, and how to connect it to the sustainable development goals? That's one of the challenges uh, in the whole UNESCO system, and uh, there are a number of uh, possibilities. One of the uh, things that UNESCO did was to set up uh, a set of 12 ethical principles, and if you do uh, uh, this kind of word cloud, this is the word cloud of the convention text where you see a lot of uh, different words uh, with state parties being central to, to the whole idea. If you do the world cloud on the 12 ethical principles, so rephrasing the convention in other words, you see a number of words popping up. Intangible heritage, groups, cultural, individuals, and communities. So there's a tendency, let's try to uh, take the communities uh, more seriously. And I will not have time to uh, go into this. If you look at the ethical principles, you find an interesting tension between, on the other hand, on the one hand, emphasizing the autonomy of these groups and communities that they can make up their own mind. On the other hand, a number of interventions, for instance, introducing the Agenda 2030 as a policy plan, and the whole tension that is going on in a lot of uh, places today is uh, how to combine these two tendencies. Okay. The UNESCO Convention, as I mentioned, it's a text full of very vague concepts, not defined, like communities, groups, and individuals. And one way UNESCO tries to deal with this is to make operational guidelines or operation directives. Every two years, they can make a number of new texts interpreting this. And in 2015 and 2016, a whole new chapter of these operational directives were added. And as you can read here, safeguarding intangible cultural heritage and sustainable development at the national level. Through this new set of texts, referring to food security, health care, quality education, gender equality, and so on, or the whole Agenda 2030 was introduced in how to work with the uh, 2003 convention. The same thing happened uh, in other conventions. So uh, if you look at the chapters, you can actually follow the different uh, elements. 
One of uh, the most important uh, guidelines you find here in guideline 170 and 171, where they basically state you have to combine a lot of uh, approaches uh, relating to economic, social, and environmental development, peace and security. And then to this end, you shall facilitate cooperation with relevant experts, culture brokers, and mediators throughout a participatory approach. This is the key to actually make this work. In guideline 171, you see the same emphasis on collaboration, participatory approaches, and the cooperation with sustainable development experts and culture brokers. This is a way to make, uh, for instance, uh, the sustainable development goals work and to translate it to, to local programs. I will skip a number of elements because I see uh, the time is running out. So in this 2003 convention, you see through these operational guidelines that this Agenda 2030 is put on the agenda. For the World Heritage Convention, they also try to do this and they try to focus on, on uh, what is happening in cities. And in 2011, there's an important recommendation on the historic urban landscape the so-called hull, and uh, in this recommendation you find all these idea about, ideas about participatory approaches, for instance, inviting people, think about uh, the Curieus and the Curious Noses program, to undertake comprehensive surveys and mapping of the city's natural and cultural human research, resources to reach consensus using participatory planning and stakeholder consultation on what to do. So this is proposed by UNESCO to work in cities and to try to develop that notion of uh, world heritage and urban heritage into something that might work. Okay, I will, as I see, if you wanted to read more about it, go to the UNESCO website, type in historic uh, uh, urban landscape, and you'll find a whole set, set of publications explaining uh, what can be done. Okay. One book I could recommend is this book by Labadie and Logan, Urban Heritage, Development and Sustainability, International Frameworks, National and Local Government, Governance. In this book you find an overview of different ways that UNESCO tries to uh, deal with these problems. And one of the authors, Janet Blake, who focused on intangible heritage, uh, noticed that especially in the field of intangible heritage we need... Uh, uh, more work and uh, capacity building on how to do this. I will give a, a last example. And then, uh, a last example. It's one of the items that was inscribed in that old list of masterpieces. In 2005, a number of uh, parades in Belgium and France, the so called processional giants and dragons in Belgium in uh, five cities, were inscribed. And there was a whole political game around this. Uh, in Flanders, we had to find two examples. Uh, there was one example in Dendermonde, a parade of the horse Bayard, this kind of giant horse. You see here, it, it goes out in Dendermonde every 10 years. It was inscribed. They had to find another example, and they came up with uh, the city of Mechelen, where there is this kind of parade every 25 years. And in that time when we had to find, or they had to find a number of examples, uh, Mechelen was proposed. This was inscribed on the masterpieces list, and since 2008, it was transferred to that representative list. And uh, so it was inscribed by UNESCO, and in Mechelen, uh, this parade goes on every uh, 25 years, so it was in 1988 that the last parade went on. And as 2013 was approaching, the city council and the people from Mechelen noticed, oh, our uh, big parade is coming, and apparently we are on this UNESCO representative list, so the whole world will look at what we do. How did we organize this uh, the, the last time, and what should we do to be compatible with what UNESCO uh, does? It was a very traditional parade, uh, using this kind of giant figures, uh, going around the, 
the city of Mechelen, uh, a number of par parades. So a few years ago, in 2012, the challenge was, what should we do? The wo whole world, the whole world is watching. Apparently, we have to do something participatory. What can we do? And then this group of ladies, the heritage cell of Mechelen, they came in and they acted as this culture, culture broker unit. And they started mobilizing the whole city to work uh, and to give new life to this old procession. They not only restored the giant figures, but they also uh, invited uh, young children to uh, think about the future of giants. There were a number of new dragons uh, constructed. There were people knitting, uh, uh, knitting uh, clothes for the giant, but also to decorate the city. So there was a huge dynamics in the city. And uh, what, they what these uh, young ladies managed to do is to mobilize the whole community in transforming uh, this old parade into something new. And for instance, two new giants, uh, Noah and Amir, they were included in the, in the parade and they were also inscribed in the city register. Here you see that mayor, uh, Bart Somers again, where he did this. And one of the core symbols is who could ride the Bayard horse. Uh, in order to be able to do this, you have, you have to have four brothers in the same family uh, that uh, can be presented. And they had the option to choose between a family who lived in Mechelen for decades and a, a young family of Turkish uh, refugees who entered the city and it was, uh, it was a kind of election uh, held and actually these four Turkish boys were put on the central horse uh, of the parade. So they managed to, to uh, transform and to uh, safeguard this tradition. Okay. So what should you, you remember of my talk? On the one hand, intangible culture heritage is not world heritage, it's something else. Participatory methods are crucial. Article 15 of the 2003 convention, involving communities, groups, and individuals. Uh, the historic urban landscape approach. If you read the document, you will see that participation is crucial, so it's the way to go. It's a way of safeguarding this transmission by transforming it in a participatory way is crucial. Culture brokerage, translation and mediation, according to my research, these are critical success factors. The Agenda 2030 and Chapter 6 of the Operation Directives of the 2003 Convention are very nice way to, ways to deal with ethical, ethical principles and the challenges that were uh, proposed. Uh, there are interesting stories to be uh, developed using these metaphors of the Tower of Babel combining flooding, city building, ways of living, connecting, embracing diversity and frames. I think we can learn something uh, from uh, Bruegel there. And the last part, please, if you are interested, go to the UNESCO website, discover this historic urban landscapes recommendation, the convention of 2003, and please visit the Bruegel exhibition before the 13th of January next year. Okay, I thank you very much for your attention.